All right, well, open your Bibles if you have them to Revelation chapter 3. We'll be in verses uh, 14 and reading to the end in verse 22. As you have there in your Bibles, we're wrapping up our study of the seven churches of Revelation. Uh, Tonight, we're going to be considering Jesus' message to the church of Laodicea, their church of the Laodiceans. And uh, as we've traveled our journey together, we've already heard a few messages Jesus has given to various churches. We talked about the loveless church in Ephesus, the suffering church of Smyrna, the, uh, let's see, the corrupt church of Thyatira, the compromising church of Pergamos, the dead church of Sardis, last time we were together, the faithful church of Philadelphia, and then this evening we'll talk about the lukewarm church and Jesus' message to them in Laodicea. And so Revelation chapter 3, beginning in verse 14, as we consider the message and what we can learn from it, uh, verse 14 reads this way, and to the angel of the church of the Laodiceans write, These things says the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. I know your works, that you are neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I am rich, have become wealthy, and have need need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched, Miserable, poor, blind, and naked, I counsel you uh, to, to you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, that you may be rich, and white garments that you may be clothed, that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed, and anoint your eyes with eye salve, that you may see. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten, therefore be zealous and repent. Behold. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. As I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The word of the Lord. And as we get to walk through uh, this final message from Christ to the church of Laodicea, the lukewarm church. We're going to consider what the message is and what we learn from it. I'd like to give us a few headings that will guide us in our study. We'll first take a look at the context as we do or have each week in verse 14. We'll then move in uh, to the corrections in verses 15 to 16 and then discuss Christ's counsel to the church in verses 17 and following to the end of verse 22. We, we begin with the context. And each of the messages that Jesus gives to each of the churches is about the same. Jesus begins to um, uh, tell us the recipient of the letter and then describes himself in a unique way with a title that is relevant to the situation that the church is in, borrowing language that we already read about Christ in chapter 1. The recipient of this letter is the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. Now, each week we say, what is this angel we're talking about? Could be a heavenly messenger, could be an earthly messenger. In the context of these local churches, it probably refers to the local pastor of the church. And so when you think of the messenger who declares the word of God to the people, it's usually the pastor, and it's, that's who we're probably talking about here. And this is the angel of the church of the Laodiceans. Now, if you were to take a look at these seven churches on a map, you would see that we're almost traveling in a, in a C-shape And uh, Laodicea, we looked at Philadelphia last time, is about 40 miles southeast of Philadelphia. It was a city that was wealthy, um, but it was also a city that was prone to earthquakes. Um, About 35 years before the book of Revelation is written, uh, in 60 AD, the city was destroyed by an earthquake, but because they were wealthy... They had the ability to rebuild quite quickly, but they didn't need any loans or help from the Roman Empire like someone like Philadelphia in which they took loans out. And so not only were they wealthy, they were self-sufficient. Now now that's significant because as we're going to see, that reflects uh, within the church. 
Uh, The culture on the outside, they were wealthy and self-sufficient. And in the inside of the church, they were also wealthy and self-sufficient to the point that we're going to see today that their material wealth blinded them to their spiritual poverty. And so they were depending on their wealth, their own resources, rather than relying on the resources of God. And so the reason they were wealthy is because when you think of Wall Street today, Laodicea was the Wall Street of Asia Minor. You had rich bankers who were there. They produced uh, wool cloth as a means of production. And so they were very wealthy. They were also a a place where um, uh, they were known for their medicine. And one product in particular was an eye salve that was produced in Laodicea that would um, help with any kind of ailment of the eyes, and so they would uh, use that and send that out to different places. And that's significant, too, because Jesus, as we're going to see, is going to describe them as blind, and he's going to give them a spiritual ointment that will give them the ability to see the truth of who Jesus is and the word that he provides them. But while it was a wealthy city, they had one thing against them, and it was their water. They had terrible water in Laodicea. And that's going to be significant as well, because Jesus is going to tell them, spiritually speaking, you're not hot, you're not cold, you're lukewarm, and therefore I will spit you out of my mouth. One scholar writes this, for all its wealth, it could produce neither the healing power of hot water like its neighbor Aeropolis, nor the refreshing water of cold water to be found at Colossae, but merely lukewarm water, useful only as an emetic. In other words, you drink the stuff, and all it helps you do is throw up. And so this uh, place, historically, didn't have good water, and that ultimately what led to the people abandoning the city as a whole. And so that gives us helpful background information to consider the relevance of Jesus' message, who's going to give them a message that is spiritual in Nature, And so it's to the pastor, the angel of the church of the Laodiceans, and Jesus describes himself, as we've said, in a unique way to each of these churches. To this one, the reason he he describes himself in these three ways is in order to prepare them for the correction he's going to give them. And the three titles Jesus gives them is, I am the Amen. I am the faithful and true witness. I am the beginning of the creation of God. Jesus begins and says, I am the amen. Now, we usually say amen in the context of our prayers. The term amen literally means, so let it be. Uh, When we say amen in the context of prayer, we are making a declaration of agreement. So when I say a prayer in the context of the church, and I say amen, sometimes we'll say, and everyone said, Amen. And the reason you're saying amen is because you're in agreement with, with, with what is being prayed. Sometimes I'll pray with my girls before bed, and I'll say, okay, and everyone said amen, and one of them will not. And I say, are you not in agreement with what we just prayed for, that you would get good rest tonight, and that you would accept Christ into your heart and your life, and uh, you would be blessed. And so the word amen literally is a declaration of agreement. Sometimes we'll say amen in the context of a sermon or after a song in worship, and we're declaring our agreement with the word of God that's being preached and proclaimed. We're in agreement with the song of praise that is lifted up to the Lord. In the Gospels, Jesus says, as he introduces statements, he says, amen, Amen, which can be translated verily, verily, truly, truly. And what he's doing is he's introducing the certainty of what he's about to say, highlighting the authority of his word. And so when Jesus declares to this church as he's preparing to confront them with his word, he's reminding them of the certainty of his word. When Jesus speaks, he's authoritative and true, so we better listen up. And so Jesus declares, I am the amen. Secondly, he declares himself to be faithful and true, the faithful and true witness. As faithful, we're reminded that God makes promises and he keeps them. Uh, We've got good friends, we've got good family members, maybe even your spouse who you can rely on and you can trust they're faithful to you. But sooner or later, they'll disappoint you, unfortunately. 
But the God we worship and serve is a faithful and true witness. He will never leave us nor forsake us. Man may disappoint us, but God never will. And as the faithful and true witness, he is trustworthy. And so when he declares his word, not only can we depend on its certainty and its surety, but we can also trust his word to be true. He's about to confront them with some hard truths. He's going to say, you're lukewarm. And you know what, how I feel about lukewarm, spiritually speaking, I, you make me sick. I want to spit you out of my mouth. And when Jesus says that, you would think he's done with us. If you tell somebody... You make me sick. You probably won't see that person again, but as we're going to see in our text, Jesus says he disciplines those whom he loves. The fact that he calls them out and chastens them is evidence that he loves them. And so he's the faithful and true witness. Thirdly, he's the beginning of the creation of God. Now, when we're talking about the beginning, we're talking about both order and rank. When we're talking about order, when he says, I'm the beginning of the creation of God, he's saying, before creation was, I am. Jesus is distinct from creation as the creator. He is the first and the last. He is the alpha and the omega, the first letter of the Hebrew alphabet, the last letter of the Hebrew alphabet. He was at the beginning and he will be at the end. Why? Because he is eternal. He is outside of creation. And if he's eternal and outside of creation, he is sovereign. And if he's sovereign, we should surrender to him and submit to what his word has to say. It doesn't just refer to order, it refers to rank. When it says Jesus is the beginning of the creation of God, it's saying as one who is outside of creation, he rules and reigns over it. In the beginning, you read Genesis 1.1, God. So at the beginning, God already existed. So if Jesus already existed at the beginning, who is he? He's God. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And as the creator, as the eternal creator of the universe, as the second person of the Trinity, Jesus has the authority to reign and rule over all. And so when he confronts his church, the local church, with the truth of his word, the proper response as we prepare our hearts for the confrontation that he's going to give us, the criticism that he provides for us is to listen, is to hear and to heed and to submit to the reign and rule of his word in our lives. So where our lives are out of alignment with his word, we align it under it. And in all things, in the ministries of the church, our desire is to serve Christ and him crucified. We've been talking about how Jesus knows everything about the church. He's intimately involved with them. He holds the seven stars, which represent the seven angels who are the pastors of the local church in his hand. He protects them, and he also holds them accountable. He's walking among the seven golden lampstands. He's intimately involved in the local church, including our own. And because of that, we need to prepare our hearts accordingly. So, as we wrap up verse 14, we're reminded who is Jesus. Jesus is the one who prepares his church for the criticism he's going to give them, for the confrontation and the corrections he's going to give them by declaring, I am the amen, I am the faithful and true witness, and I am the beginning of the creation of God. He's sovereign, and he rules and reigns over all. And so, what does that mean for us? What do we learn from that in Twi- at Twin Rivers in the 21st century? Number one, if Jesus is the amen, we're to prepare our hearts if ever God should confront us, and we should always be ready for God's word to confront us by being reminded of the certainty of his word. You know, I think of Psalm 119, 9 through 11, that says, how can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to your word. With my whole heart I have sought you. Oh, let me not wander from your commandments. Your word, O Lord, I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. Uh, When you are reminded that Jesus is the amen, when you are reminded of the certainty of his word, 
it allows us then to cry out like the psalmist, oh, your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. How, how can a young man cleanse his way by taking heed according to your word? And so, as the amen, be certain of his word. Secondly, as a church who prepares our heart for confrontation individually, corporately as a church body, as the faithful and true witness, we are invited also not just to believe in the certainty of his word, but to trust the faithfulness of his word. When God sends forth a promise, you can believe he's going to keep that promise. Whether it's a promise of judgment upon those who refuse to repent or a promise of blessing and the crown of life and eternal life for those who are committed to trust him and follow after him. To those who overcome, what are they given? The crown of life. And then thirdly, if, if Jesus is the beginning of the creation of God, the sovereign king who rules and reigns over all things, we are to prepare our hearts for any way that the word of God may confront us by means of being ready in humility to submit to his reign and rule. When I open my Bible for a devotional, I need to prepare my heart. Sometimes my heart is hardened towards even reading what I'm going to read, hardened by the circumstances of life, hardened by a particular relationship because I'm not responding in the way that I should. And instead I should say, God, before I even begin my study today, even begin to read your word, I need to make sure I'm fully submitted and surrendered to it. And so it's a reminder. Help me to prepare my heart accordingly. Psalm 139, 23 to 24 says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Know my anxieties. Lord, know me. He knows you already. But the reason you are asking that is you are inviting him in. God, know me and make those things known and see if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way of the everlasting. In other words, you're inviting God to point out some area of hardness in your heart, sin in your life, and you're asking him to not just point it out but lead you in the right direction. God, I've been hardened towards your word in relationship to this. I haven't been producing the fruit of the Spirit in my relationships. Lord, turn me around and turn me back to you. If I could open it up for discussion, uh, when is it most difficult to receive correction from the Lord and how can we prepare our hearts to receive it in times like that? When is it most difficult to receive correction from the Lord? Sure, when you love your sin more <laughs> than you love God. I, I think that's so true. And uh, when the word of God confronts us with our sin, we don't want to hear it. Yeah. You love your sin. What are other times when it's difficult to be confronted with the word of God? For me, it's difficult to be confronted with the word of God when um, I hear the word or I read the word and say, this is great for, the, for, for him. <laughs> That's a great message for him without first applying it to me. And my heart is hardened towards the word because I'm thinking of everyone else and how they could use that word when I needed it to be applied to my life. Anything else? When do you find it difficult to hear the word? Pride is huge. Yeah. Um, yeah, thinking we're okay. We're, we're spiritually sound. We're doing well. Steve. Sure. Sure, sure. Yeah. I think sometimes you go through the motions, you read your Bible, you go to church, you check it off, and then you're like, oh, the Lord wants me to change something <laughs> or do something differently or cut this or that out of my life, and that is difficult. You're cutting the flesh out. That is hard. Yeah. How about on the other side of the question, how do you prepare for times like that when they come, not if they come, but when they come. Practical ways you prepare your heart to, to receive the word. Yeah, so, yeah, so 
so adopting a heart of repentance and saying, Lord, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to change. I'm going to change my mind about this. Um, we're stubborn people. I don't know about you, but I'm a stubborn person. And when you're in that state of stubbornness, it's hard to say, okay, God, I, I'm ready to listen. Even when you know the word and you know what God has to say in it about forgiveness and, and somebody offends you or hurts you or bitterness that you're holding on to, um, you, our flesh likes to react. And so it's, it's, yeah, having just a heart of repentance. And God provides that, I think, asking for help. Lord, help me. Anything else? Yeah, Dennis. Oh, yeah. Sure, sure. It's the norm. And, uh, yeah, that's difficult. Yes, we serve the Lord and we seek to please God over man and sometimes fellow christians may justify particular sins or you can talk this way or do that and the reality is you you got to obey god over man anything else yeah good stuff overall i i think we need that kind of reminders how do i how do i overcome my stubbornness my hardened heart in times when i don't want to listen i think one of the ways is just going to church when you don't want to uh, attending a, a, a small group when you say, I'm not ready, and just uh, continuing to, to do what you, you know you should as the Lord begins to work on your heart. And break it down sometimes and overcome that, those fleshly desires. So we begin with the context. Jesus prepares the church at Laodicea for the corrections he's going to give them by reminding them of who he is. Secondly, we see the, the correction. Jesus goes on to say in Verses 15 to 16, I know your works. Every church, he begins the same. I know, I know, I know. He knows Twin Rivers. And that should either scare you half to death or that should encourage you greatly because this I know your works is given to these churches in the context of commendation, but it's also given in the context to other churches in the, in the context of correction. If you remember Sardis, I mean, we got, they got correction. There were, they were barely holding on for life. Jesus said, you've got a reputation, you're alive, but reality is you're dead, and there are only a faithful few among you. I mean, at least they got that commendation. The church at Laodicea, nothing. It's all correction. At least they have hope that Jesus still loves them. He's, he's literally been pushed out of the church. He's not even in the church at this point. He's knocking on the door waiting for somebody to let him in, and he's quite gracious. He says, if anyone opens the door and lets me in, I'll come in and I'll dine with you. This is a church that he says, I know your works. I know the good that you don't do, and he describes it accordingly. He says that you are neither hot nor cold. What does Jesus think of the ministries of their church? What does Jesus think of their work in terms of edifying the saints and evangelizing the lost? He says, you are neither hot nor cold. And he says, this is my desire. I wish you were cold or hot. The question then presents itself. What does he mean by cold and hot? What does he mean by lukewarm? Well, in this context right away, what does he mean by cold and hot? He says, that's what's desirable to him. That's what's pleasing to him. And he says, when it comes to you, so then because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot. So what is lukewarm? Not pleasing to God. The works of the church, the ministries of the church, the love of the church, it's not pleasing to Jesus. And Jesus says, because you are neither hot nor cold, he uses um, very vivid language here, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Jesus is saying, you literally make me sick. Those are strong words from Christ. You say, oh, I can't, can, can you imagine, you know, the, the church at Laodicea, they're the ones to read their message last. They got to read all of the others, and you ended with Philadelphia. Oh, the faithful church. Lord, what do you have for us? You make me sick. I want to spit you out of my mouth. You pushed me out of the church. I'm knocking on the door. Will somebody let me in so I can come in and dine with you? Um, 
the worst time I've ever felt nauseous, I got to go back to COVID. COVID. I remember getting so sick with COVID, and the worst part of COVID is, is I couldn't eat because I was so nauseous. And I remember about six or seven days into it, my wife came to me with some, you know, those saltine crackers and says, eat this right now. And I said, I can't do it. She said, just take a bite to live. And so I remember trying to take a bite of that. And the only thing that would, that would uh, alleviate the nausea was, um, um, you know, Sprite. Uh, and so just taking little sips of that, eventually went to the doctor when I gave up and they finally gave me some meds. But I just remember even thinking of crackers or any kind of food, it just makes you so nauseous. You just want to throw it up. If, if, even if I smelt some food in the house, that would make me literally sick. Jesus is saying this about the church. You make me sick. You're a church who is lukewarm. You're neither hot nor cold. You're not desirable. You're not pleasing. And so I'm going to spit you out of my mouth. As we keep reading, it goes on to say, um, I know your works that you are neither hot nor cold. I wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth because you say I am rich, you have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know what, that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Um, I think we can pause there for just a moment and say, how does that apply to us in regards to the correction? As we prepare our hearts to receive what Jesus has to say with words that are certain and true, that are faithful and true, that deserve to be surrendered to and submitted to, I would say, number one, make the number one pursuit of your life a desire to please God. As we're going to see in a moment, as I just read verse 17, the trouble the church had was that they were blind to see their need for Christ. They were blinded to see their spiritual poverty because of their material wealth, and they thought they were good when they weren't. Their problem, as we're going to go to more, to, more into in a moment, is their self-sufficiency and their self-righteousness. Their self-reliance. They thought they were in a right place with God when the reality was they were not. And the reason is because of their indifference to the things of God. It's not that they had left God completely. You know, the apostate church, as we've read in earlier churches, makes Jesus angry. This church makes Jesus sick. And when we are indifferent to God and he's not the top priority of our life and, and, and we begin to see little compromises, that's not what we should not, should not be our priority. Um, how do you make Jesus the top priority of your life? I just want to list a few things. Please, God, over the influences of the world. Those influences creep in very easily. Please, God, over the indulgences of the flesh. And then thirdly, please, God, over the preferences of the of man. Oh, how churches can stray because everybody in the church has an opinion for how to do ministry effectively. When we should be applying the truth of God's word in regards to how we should be doing ministry. Now, in, in churches, methods may change, but the message remains the same. You know, we may have different strategies for how we're going to reach the lost for Christ in our particular context, but the message doesn't shift, the message doesn't change. So make the number one pursuit of your life a desire to please God. Secondly, abandon anything that would hinder your pursuit of God and his will for your life. And so I wanted to invite us to think about anything that would hinder him being the top priority of our life. Is it fleshly desire? Is it a worldly influence? Is there something that you love more than God, even your own sin, and fulfilling the desires of your flesh? What are those things and abandon them? Um, I wanted to open up for discussion. Uh, what are some practical ways to make God the top priority of our lives? And what would happen if we did? What would happen to the church if God was really the top priority of our life? If, 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 our mission to go and make disciples was the top priority of our life. So two sides of the question. Uh, how do you make God the top priority of your life, practically speaking? And uh, what difference does that make? Yeah. 
you know. So I'm... So you start your day with God, and he's the, your first thought. His word is the first thing you go to. Uh, prayer is the, the first conversation you have for the day. Before you talk to anyone else, God, that's, that's good. You keep God the top priority, putting him first, first thing in the morning. What else? Yeah, so just praying throughout the day, thanking him for the way that he, he's there with you, his presence, the way that he's moving, and uh, just an awareness of the Lord's presence, certainly. Thanking him throughout the day. Anything else? How do you make God the top priority of your life? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is having a right perspective of God, his greatness, his glory, his power. And when you have a right perspective of God, we're little grasshoppers. Hopping around, it puts ourselves into perspective and then he becomes the top priority not my will lord i'm just a grasshopper (laughs) not my way i'm going to serve you and what you want and what you want is best even when i don't understand it or i i don't want it so having a right perspective of god and really a heart of worship glorifying god anything else how do you make god the top priority of your life this is important since we should you want to answer the other side. What would happen if we actually did? We started first thing in the morning. Lord, you're the first thought on my heart. You're, you're the first conversation I have in the morning. What would happen if I wake up and I say, Lord, who, who am I? <laughs> but a man, you know, that you are mindful of me. The son of man that you love me. Uh, what would happen? What would happen if we saw God in proper perspective? What would happen for the church, you know? When I think of putting God... Uh, top in my life and, and he's the priority, then I'm not sitting on the throne of my life. I'm not making decisions. He is ruling over the thoughts of my mind, my heart, my actions. So everything. And so that changes. I have a different attitude during the day. I'm more mindful of being missional. And I see conversations as opportunities to serve the Lord. I'm not just thinking about myself or what I want. What would happen if the entire church put God first? He was the top priority of Twin Rivers Church. We get over 300 people, including children on Sundays. What would happen if those 300 plus people said, Jesus is the top priority of my life? Can we dream a little bit? What would happen? What do you think? What's that? We'd turn Springfield upside down for Christ, right? Um, He's the top. We can't stop talking about him. We're going to serve. We're going to talk to people about Jesus. Yeah, it's going to impact our community. People are going to start hearing the good news. Yeah. What else? What else? The community changes. Sure. Sure. Yeah, so Wanda's saying the harvest is plentiful, and so if we're faithful to share the gospel, we just need some workers to go out and declare, and the Lord is faithful to add according to his will, certainly. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So the next generation will hear of the goodness of God and pass it on to their children, their children's children, and for generations to come, we'll have people serving the Lord. Anything else? Yeah, Steve. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're salt and light. 
And so we're moral preservatives in our culture. As we speak up for truth, we speak up for th- those without a voice, uh, those who are the most vulnerable among us. As we share the good news of the gospel, it pushes back the darkness and shines the light of Christ. And light shines brightest in dark places. Oh, what it would happen if we prayed that, Lord, that we would not be lukewarm, but we would be hot or cold, that we would be pleasing according to your will so that we can be the effective church you call us to be, both as a, a church body, but individually as well. And so the context, the correction, um, he says, you're neither hot nor cold, I'm going to vomit you out of my mouth, and then uh, the council. P- verse 17 says this, because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing, and do not know that you are wretched and miserable, poor, blind, and naked. As we said earlier, their material wealth has blinded them to their spiritual poverty. They have so dependent on, depended on their resources that they have no need for the Holy Spirit. You say, how do you get to a point where you're that wealthy? I'd love to be a part of that church, to know I'm that wealthy, and yet we get to see what ends up happening to this church. You know, we tend to talk about wealth comparatively. I always like to remind us we are incredibly wealthy. Our church, in regards to our basic needs being met and having so much more, is incredibly wealthy. I'd say you're wealthy if you have more than the clothes on your back and a roof over your head. We have so much more than that. We are so blessed as a church family. And because of that, we're reminded that not only can that be a blessing, but that can be a deception as well. Uh, To to blind us to the spiritual poverty that we may have. What does that look like? Well, if I could use it in the context of worship real fast. You know, if you're in a church, sometimes you can be deceived thinking that the lights, that the smoke, and the emotion is a move of the Spirit. Can you be in a church where there's light, smoke, and emotion, and you can worship in spirit and truth? Yes. But you can also be in a church with light, smoke, and music, and think the spirit is here when the reality is he is not. How easily can we be deceived? We can be deceived into having programs that we think are effective, that are helpful, when the reality is we need to be focused on the mission of the church to edify the body by teaching and preaching the truths of God's word. And we know we're being effective when those who are equipped are going out and evangelizing the lost. And then Ephesians chapter 4 verses 11 to 16 takes place. The church is is being equipped for the work of ministry. God is being glorified. Jesus Christ is being exalted. And in all things, he's being glorified. And so what we need to guard against, this church needed to guard against, was self-sufficiency. We don't need the Spirit. We've got money. (laughs) We've got programs. We've got business principles, leadership principles principles from the world, and ultimately that's what's going to grow our church. We'll go to the different houses in our neighborhood, we'll knock on the doors and ask them, what do you want in a church? What would make you come to our church? And then they tell us, and we go, okay, we'll, we'll, have, a, we'll have what you want. And ultimately you're thinking it's the move of the Spirit, and the reality is we're depending on our own uh, strategies are a man's systems. Now, can God work in those things? Oh, yeah, but he can also, we can also be deceived into thinking that's doing anything for us when the reality is it's not. And so they're blinded to their spiritual poverty because of their material wealth. And he goes into detail about that, right? He says, um, um, and do not know. How do you not know? You're wretched, You're sinful. You do not know you're miserable, uh, that you're in a pitiful state. You think you guys are okay. You're doing fine. You're going through the motions. You you, you go to church each week. You you, you serve here and there, yet your heart is indifferent to the things of God. Poor, like spiritually speaking, you are poor. You think you're wealthy and you're not. Another church, he told them they were poor materially speaking, but he told them you're rich. 
because of the spirit that you have. And we're reminded where true riches come from. And then he goes on to say, you're blind, you cannot see, and you are naked. And so, their self-sufficiency, they're blind to see the truth of, of their current spiritual condition. They are in a state of spiritual poverty. And then he says, I counsel you to do this. Buy from me gold refined in fire. He just told them, you're poor, spiritually speaking. How do you become rich? You come to the one who has the key to the treasury of heaven. Last time we, we, we talked about Jesus who, who has the key, the, the, the key of David. Whatever door he opens, no one can shut. Whatever door he shuts, no one can close. And when Jesus opens the door of the treasuries of heaven, we get to enter in. And so we're told to buy from him gold. How do you buy from him gold? You come to him in faith. You say, Jesus, I have nothing to offer, and I'm going to trust you as my Savior and Lord. He promises them spiritual riches. What are these spiritual riches? An eternal relationship with him and his people forever. An inheritance of heaven. You're poor, but you can be rich in the Lord. Secondly, he says, I counsel you that you may be rich and, and white garments that you may be clothed. You're wretched. You're, you're miserable. You're in a pitiful state, but I will give you the clothes of righteousness. You know, the righteousness you think you have in your self-sufficiency, it's filthy rags, the Bible says. He says, take off the filthy rags, exchange them for the white garments. You're naked and you can be clothed with the clothes of righteousness that I can give you through faith in Jesus. And then it says that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that you may see. Uh, and so, you're blind. You cannot see the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, the, the God of this age has blinded you of the, uh, of the truth of the gospel of the glory of Christ. And yet, what we get to see here is Jesus has the ointment that will resolve your spiritual eye ailment so that you can see. You ever hear the, the testimony of those who have trusted in Jesus? I was blind, but now I see. I was dead, but now I am alive. And Jesus counsels them accordingly. Come to me for spiritual riches, for righteous clothes, white garments, and for the ability to resolve your eye ailments. Verse 19, he says, As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. A scary moment is when Jesus leaves you to yourself. And when you sit, no longer say, Let your will be done. And Jesus says, let your will be done. That's judgment. As long as you are being held accountable, as long as you are being convicted of your sin by the word of God, you are being reminded that you are loved and cared for by a father who loves you greatly. And this church is encouraged. Even though in a moment we're going to see Jesus is outside the doors. Um, Proverbs 3.12 says, For whom the Lord loves, he corrects just as a father, the son in whom he delights. May we pray for the correction of the Lord to convict our hearts, especially when it's difficult to be confronted. Um, Hebrews 12, 7 to 11 says, if you endure chastening, God deals with you as with sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? Uh, but if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you are illegitimate and not sons. You're not being treated like a child of God. Furthermore, we have human fathers who corrected us and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? For they indeed for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he for our profit that we may be partakers of his holiness. We're grateful for our earthly fathers who disciplined us as best as they knew how, but our heavenly father pursues us and disciplines us that we might be partakers of holiness, clothed in his righteousness. Verse 11, now no chastening seems to be joyful for the present, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. And so it's just a helpful reminder to say, Lord, help me to open my heart to the, to the correction you give me. 
as a church, if there's any way that we are not honoring you, glorifying you in the things that we do, um, help us identify those things and, and live for you and glorify you in all things. Verse, 19, verse 20, he says, Behold, another counsel. Look, I stand at the door and knock. Now often, too often, we hear that verse in the context of evangelism, right? Jesus is knocking at the door. He's waiting for you to let him in. He won't force himself into your heart and your life. And you could possibly use that to say, hey, uh, Jesus offers you the free gift of salvation. Whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him shouldn't perish but have everlasting life. And you have an opportunity to trust in Jesus as your Savior and Lord. But as we take a look at the context here, we're talking about an actual church. A church that's not described as dead, it's described as lukewarm. It's a church that has pushed Jesus out of the church because of their self-sufficiency, because of their self, self-righteousness, and because of their self-reliance. Those are three things that we need to guard ourselves against personally, and we need to guard our church against corporately. When we figure it out and think, we know what we're doing, and we don't really need to pray anymore, that's a scary place to be. When I start my day and think to myself, I got this, God. I know what I'm doing. Now, I've been doing this for years. I've been in ministry this long. I've been serving in this church for this much a time. And we stop relying on the Lord. That's a scary place to be. He says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice. They've grown so cold to their knowledge of God's voice that no one is opening the door even though Jesus is knocking. He's giving the invitation, let me in. And I will come in. Oh, what joy. This church is not too far lost. I will come in and dine with him and he with me. There's still an opportunity to repent and abide. We can go back to to John chapter 15. What does it mean to let Jesus in the church abide in him? He, uh, he is the vine. We are the branches. All we need to do is stay connected to him. Stay connected to him in prayer. Stay connected to him in his word as we are reminded of its certainty, of its trustworthiness, that we submit to it in all areas of our lives. And then it says, to him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne. You have pushed me out of the church but if you will overcome, you will get the, the opportunity to, to sit with me on my throne, to rule and reign with Christ. Wow, what an amazing thought that is. As I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. Isn't it amazing when you consider that you and I, apart from Christ, were wretched sinners? Deserving of judgment and eternal wrath to spend eternity without God and his people forever. Jesus provides us salvation as a free gift, but not just the opportunity to be in heaven. Because if we're a slave or a servant, just just cleaning the, the streets of gold, like, I'll be there. Let me take that. But you get to, to be with, the, with God on his throne. You get to rule and reign with Christ in the life to come. Verse 22. This is a message to every single church. It says this. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is an invitation for the individuals of the church to say, Jesus, what do you have to say to me today? Is my heart hardened when I come to a devotional? Is my heart hardened when I come to a, a, a Sunday gathering? Is my heart hardened when I come to a small group? Lord, if, if, if that is the case, I need to listen up. Give, help me. Give me the right heart. Confront me in those areas of sin or, or indifference, uh, ways that, 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 that I've lost focus of you as the top pursuit and top desire of my life. God, I want, to, I want you to be there on the throne of my life. Lord, my love for you has, has grown cold. 
I want to pursue you as when I first came to Christ and you know I was so excited about the things of God. I want to get back there. I want to serve you in your church. I want to be equipped to, to make you known to those in my circle who, who don't know. I want to pray for them. I want to love them. I want to serve you and glorify you in everything. He who has an ear to hear, let him hear what Jesus says to the churches. If I could give us just a few takeaways in light of the council, just a few reminders and takeaways here. Thank God for his patience and mercy. He's waiting at the door and knocking, and the church won't let him in. If anyone hears, he will come in and dine with them. Think, I mean, think about the Lord just knocking continuously, so gracious and kind, and no one is opening the door. It's a reminder for one person to step up. If there are just a faithful few, one faithful follower of Christ to say, Lord, I'm coming to get the door so you will come in. Thank God for his patience and mercy. Guard against the pride of self-sufficiency by your reliance on the Lord. Receive the spiritual riches of salvation. Be assured of Christ's love for you. If he disciplines you and chastens you, he loves you. Be zealous and repent. Be passionate for the things of God. Make him the top priority of your life. We have a few minutes to close this morning. and We're wrapping up the the, the messages Jesus gives to these seven churches. Now, the first chapter, Jesus talks about the things that, I mean, John records the things that are, or excuse me, that he's seen. So chapter one, he records the thing that he's seen as this vision comes to him back in chapter one. Chapters two to three, he records the things that are these seven churches. And then the rest of the book of Revelation, he records the things that will be. We are talking about the things that are. We're, we're living in a time where the church is still here. The rapture has not occurred. Uh, we have not yet joined the Lord in the air, and we have not yet come to rule and reign with Christ in the millennial kingdom for a thousand years. But we have an opportunity to hear what Jesus has to say to these seven churches. Let me remind them to you. Uh, the loveless church of Ephesus. And I want to ask the question, let me, before I give you the seven churches, ask you, which church would you say Twin Rivers best reflects? So let me read them, tell them to you. So the loveless church of Ephesus, they've left their first love. I mean, God knows their works. Jesus knows their works, but they've missed the mark. They've fallen short. They're, they're not as faithful as they once were. Uh, the church at Smyrna, the suffering church, the persecuted church. We talked about the compromising church of Pergamos, the corrupt church of Thyatira, the dead church of Sardis. There's only a faithful few in the body. Then we talked about the, the, the faithful church of Philadelphia. And then lastly here, the lukewarm church of Laodicea. Where is our church at? Where would you say, hey, I think I see some of this. I see some of that. What would you say, Twin Rivers? Falls. Philadelphia, the faithful church. All right, we got a. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> but they were they were weak in terms of their size and their resources, um, but they had the power of God behind them. And so if you have the power of God, your opportunities are limitless, if you remember. And so size doesn't limit you. You've got the power of God to provide all things. Sure. Oh, to be a part of a church. Oh, to be, okay, I gotcha. Yeah.
Yeah. And yet, you know, our approach to it was for the preventative, you know, looking at epidemiology and all this, that, that now the law is there to handle it better. Yeah. Sure, sure. And just be reminded there are opportunities around us that we miss sometimes. Um, but the Lord always gives us new ones, yeah. you know. And, and that's a good God we serve, certainly. Yeah. Yeah. Don't worry, we can cut this part of the... We don't have to record it. We can... <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> no, I... I my yeah, yeah, Jared. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's a scary spot to sit in. Sure. All we know is the past. Yeah, and he knows it all. Uh, and I think Jared's alluding to the fact that w- what the Spirit says to the church is, you know, listen to what um, he's saying in his word. Now, if I didn't give you an opportunity to answer that, you wouldn't have really thought about it. And so my prayer is that you would think about where do where am I at individually in, in light of the church? You know, there are some, some folks who say, I don't want to be a part of a local church. Hypocrites there, right? We can always use one more, right? Um, but when it comes to the, the local church, Jesus cares about them. Even the ones that have pushed him out, even the ones that are considered dead in his eyes, there's only a faithful few. He still cares about them, and he still loves them. And I think that's one application. I mean, the local church matters to God, and so we should be part of a body and be a member of it. But think about, where do I fit into these different churches? What is the Lord speaking to me? What is the Lord speaking to our church? And allow God to allow what we've talked about in chapters 2 to 3 continue to ruminate in our minds Think about it in our hearts and then watch what God does. Can we pray? Father, we are grateful for these uh, seven churches and the messages that you've given to each of them. Uh, It's almost an interesting thing, Lord, if you gave me a personal message or any one of the people here a personal message in our lives right now or to our church, and then everyone else got to read it, Father. Uh, That would be a a difficult thing for us, I can imagine. And yet, Lord, we get to hear uh, about these seven churches, the messages you give to each one, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, And my prayer, Father, is that as we come to a close from the church of Laodicea, our prayer is that we would either be hot or cold, pleasing in your sight, that we would not be lukewarm, displeasing to the point that we make you sick. Our desire is that you would be the top priority in regards to our lives individually and our church as a whole. And Father, our prayer is that we would be able to be an effective church who is not just equipped for the work of ministry with the truth of God's word, but equipped to evangelize the lost as we have opportunity to minister to those around us. I pray, Lord, that you would grow our witness here in Springfield, in Lane County, and literally to the ends of the earth. Help us to be faithful individually and therefore faithful as a church. What the Spirit of God tells to us as individuals who make up the church, may we listen, hear, and heed the word. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen.